My name is Greta Heathcote. I'm the Associate Director for the Work Integrated Learning for Neurodiverse Students Initiative. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today and serve as your MC for the event. So the Work Integrated Learning for Neurodiverse Students Initiative is a four-year initiative generously supported by the Sine Family Foundation to ensure that neurodivergent students thrive in work integrated learning. Today is our first, but one of many, opportunities to hear from experts in the field of neurodiversity, work integrated learning, and experiential education as we work to transform our campus into a neuroaffirming space for all students. As we begin this morning, I would like to start with an invitation to ground yourself in the space, the land that we are in. And for those of you in the room today, when you leave the Taylor Institute, maybe take a moment to step onto the grass, um, to touch a tree, so things I like to do to, to ground myself in, in our space. And for those of you joining us online, perhaps you're in different spaces today, um, just take a moment to really think about where we are, the land, the space, our work towards truth and reconciliation. The University of Calgary is located in the heart of Southern Alberta. We both acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Pekanai, the Kanai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chinookee, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nation. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. Next, I'd like to share a few words of welcome from Dr. Leslie Reed, our Vice Provost Teaching and Learning, um, who's not here with us in person this morning, but um, wanted to share a personal welcome. All brains experience and process the world around them differently. It should come as no surprise. This diversity is what makes us unique and human. The University of Calgary is focused on a shift across our community to better recognize, celebrate, and design for these differences. Work Integrated Learning, or WILL, for neurodiverse students, funded generously by the Seneve Family Foundation, is working towards systems change at UCalgary, going beyond a single program or an initiative to fundamentally shift how we think about neurodiversity and design WILL programs and experiences to be neuroaffirming. By looking at new ways of designing Work Integrated Learning and changing how we partner with students colleagues, and organizations, we can meaningfully foster environments that support neurodiverse students and ultimately all of our students. Special thanks to the Sine Family Foundation for your generosity and trust in this work. UCalgary is stronger because of the unique contributions neurodivergent people make across teaching and learning. We hope you will join us on our journey ahead. Thanks to Dr. T.C. Wiseman and Dr. Kristen Gillespie Lynch for offering your expertise and insights to us today. I wish I could be there, but I know your words will help inspire us all work towards a truly inclusive campus. The next piece is really my, my pleasure and privilege to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Kristen Gillespie Lynch and Dr. T.C. Wiseman. And I'll start with, uh, start with Kristen. Um, who's a professor of developmental and educational psychology at the College of Staten Island, CSI, and the Graduate Center, is it CUNY? Is that how you pronounce it? Thank you. <laughs> in 2012, she got her PhD from UCLA in developmental psychology. While at UCLA, she worked as a TA in one of the early programs designed to help autistic students develop employment skills through university cor coursework uh, pathways at UCLA Extension. Also, while they were both doctoral students, Kristen and Dr. Stephen K. Kapp conducted a now influential study about community conceptions of autism and the neurodiversity movement. At CSI, Kristen directs the Autism Certificate Program, a participatory mentorship program for neurodivergent college students, Project REACH. She conducts assessments, um, she conducts and assesses autism training internationally, including the autism and universal design training for post-secondary educators that she co-led with Dr. T.C. Wiseman. She leads an NSF funded program study that seeks to engage autistic youth in game design and employment workshops to help them development, develop employment skills. This grant focuses on addressing gaps in the evidence base for universal design by creating strategies to help autistic youth meaningfully shape their own educational experiences. She is also the co-PI of a new NSF-funded study to create a program where an autistic college students in Project REACH will mentor autistic high school students. She is an advisor for the INSAR Autistic Researchers Committee and is a member of the editorial board for the journal Autism. 
Our next speaker is Dr. T.C. Wiseman, who is an Indigenous, Pacifica, South Asian, and non-binary, and was late diagnosed as autistic at 48 years old in 2017. Since her diagnosis, T.C. co-founded the Autistic Researchers Committee at the International Society for Autism Research, INSAR, and became a founding, edi a founding editorial board member of the journal Autism and Adulthood, the only journal focused on autistic adults. T.C. is based in Vancouver and works internationally as a speaker, writer, and guest lecturer at the Crossroads of Autism, Disability Rights, Intersectionality, Universal Design, Equity in Higher Education and the Workplace, and the social systems that surround those identities. On a personal note, uh, TC shared a few words that I am sharing on her behalf today and why she's unable to join us in person. Um, and I thank her and, and send a lot of gratitude for allowing us to share her words uh, with you today. I am currently experiencing an episode of selective mutism and I am unable to speak. Though extremely rare for me in adulthood, unfortunately this is happening likely due to a high level of anxiety. I won't be able to make it for the keynote, especially given that I cannot get through airport security without speaking. My local airport can only provide ASL interpretation, but have no resources to work with someone experiencing mutism who is not deaf. I want to share this predicament with you as it's a, real, a very real part of being autistic for me. I don't want you to think I've flaked out. My reality is this is a co-occurring challenge and it is very real. I extend my deepest apologies to you, the audience. To those of you who came from Workland School of Education, um, a particular apology to that group, which she was very excited to see. Um, to support a fellow person from your alma mater, thank you so much. I appreciate your support long after I graduated from the EdD program. I'm extremely disappointed that my body cannot push through so I can be there, but it is important that you know why. Understanding the many facets of being autistic will hopefully lead to more compassion and understanding. And so although TC is not here with us in person today, I know you will hear her voice uh, in different ways through her work and expertise, um, which are woven deeply throughout the presentation today. So um, thank you to TC for sharing those words and allowing me to share on her behalf. And at this point, I would like to welcome Kristen to the stage. Thank you. So first of all, sorry that TC won't be here because her stories are, are really beautiful as those of you who know her know. And hopefully we'll be able to follow up with a webinar or something where you'll be able to hear her stories. I'm hoping that will be the case in the future. And thank you all for being here. When, when Greta and Katija reached out to TC and I to invite us to come, we were really excited because we think that the work that you're doing here is really groundbreaking and really important. And so we're very grateful to be here and to share what we can share, and also to learn from you about work integrated learning to bring ideas back to CUNY, because you're definitely far ahead of us at CUNY in terms of work integrated learning. And so we want to talk about the power of neurodiversity in the workplace and higher education and work integrated learning. And these are the take home points that we hope to return to at the end, and I think we all probably already agree with the first point, which is that it's really important to appreciate neurodiversity as a source of innovation and also that it's really important to develop strategies to overcome barriers. Because there's intense barriers that autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people face in the transition to college, in, and particularly in the transition out of college into the workplace. And so autistic people face great difficulties getting jobs that are well matched to their skills and interests. And these difficulties are particularly pronounced for people who are marginalized in other ways. And so the third point that we want to begin to address, which is one that you're focusing on here and that we're all focusing on together and we'll need to work together to address is how to use participatory processes to build systems change to address these inequities that are really impacting the quality of life of autistic people around the world and people who are neurodivergent in other ways as well. The key things that we hope to address is how to better support the academic and employment success of neurodivergent students and how to work together to promote systems change. Because we can see that we need change across all of the steps from university into the workplace and into beyond. And so the, the key topics that we're going to cover are neurodiversity and then communication across neurotypes, universal design, which I know is a central part of the initiatives here, work integrated learning and systems change. And we're starting with terms for a few reasons. One is because terms are a way to show respect for the communities that you're trying to help, but also because terms are the foundation of values, and shared values are the foundation for any type of change that you want to ha make happen. 
So neurodiversity is just the diversity of all brains. We're all part of neurodiversity. This term was coined by Singer and Bloom in the late 1990s. But these ideas have been evident in First Nations philosophies and other philosophies since the beginning of what people remember. Neurodivergence is when you apply a category of difference to someone. So when they're diagnosed or self-identify as having a condition. Autism we'll talk about more as we go along. And intersectionality is really, really important to think about in any time that you're trying to promote neurodiversity in the workplace and higher education because we've experienced such systemic barriers in access to resources for autistic people and people who are neurodivergent in other ways. So barriers in terms of identification, in terms of access to care, in terms of supports, in terms of access to higher education, in terms of access to work and supports in work. These tend to be harder for people who are marginalized in other ways, in addition to autism, to access. And so for a long time, the concern was to help people understand neurodiversity. And then the concern started to shift to a concern about how people were using the terms of neurodiversity. So there's a new idea called neurodiversity light, which is where you take on the terms of neurodiversity without really understanding them. And so you commodify neurodivergence, or you talk only about superpowers and strengths and ignore challenges associated with neurodiversity. So this is a quote from Mary Doherty, an autistic doctor who founded Autistic Doctors International talking about a huge gulf that's happening in the, in the autism field and across the range of conditions between people who are taking a genuinely neurodiversity movement affirmative approach and people who are either sticking with the medical model or taking on what looks like a neurodiversity approach but isn't really neurodiversity light. And so this is a paper that TC is one of the authors on that points to the, the need for a systems change in autism work. And it talks about the power of the neurodiversity movement and how it has already led to some really important improvements, but also all the key areas where we haven't seen those improvements yet and need to see them. So I encourage you all to read this paper. It's really excellent. One of the key points it makes is that we need to focus on quality of life and not on normalizing, obviously, and also that we learn, need to learn to speak about neurodiversity in ways that aren't ableist. And so these are the diagnostic criteria for autism. We developed this slide for a training that we gave in a, and that you'll see later in this talk for higher education educators about autism and universal design. And when I first shared this slide with an autistic PhD student I mentor at CUNY, Daniel Batkin, he was pretty horrified by it. And he's like, this is a very ableist way of talking about autism, which I'd actually never really thought of. And this slide was developed in collaboration with eight autistic and seven non-autistic scholars. And we were putting forth the diagnostic criteria for autism, which are rooted in the medical model. And there are ways that autistic advocacy have transformed these criteria, like the unusual sensory experiences. Autistic people were advocating for that being a really key part of autism for decades. And it only entered the DSM-5 criterion in 2013. So I want to problematize the diagnostic criteria a little bit in terms of the double empathy problem. So how many people have heard of the double empathy problem before? Wonderful. And so the diagnostic criteria focuses on difficulties within people and says you have social communication difficulties. But socialization doesn't happen in a person. Socialization is interactive. And so the double empathy problem was coined by an autistic researcher, Milton, who realized he was autistic after his son was diagnosed, to point out that social interaction is a two-way street and that autistic people often try a lot harder to understand non-autistic people than the reverse. And so it's a, a, a problem understanding perspectives that goes both ways, not a problem that's within autistic people that we need to fix within them. This is something that TC added as a really important point, is also problematizing this domain, the restricted interest and repetitive behaviors domain. This is the domain that my autistic PhD student was particularly critical of, because when he was a teenager, he was forced to not stim for around a year, and it was this horrible traumatic experience for him that he thinks is still impacting him. And it's going to be the focus of his dissertation, is the importance of stimming for self-regulation and for learning. And so we all stim. I stim by playing with my hair and tapping my foot and doing all kinds of stims. So, so repetitive behaviors are something that people do in general. They just do it to different degrees and in more or less obvious ways. 
Resistance to change can be persistence. Focused interest can lead to expertise. And unusual sensory experiences can mean that autistic people are seeing things that the rest of us mix, or hearing or sensing things that are important to, to know about that we're not aware of. So this reframing of autism as a valuable minority identity is one of the main goals of the neurodiversity movement. It seeks full societal inclusion for neurodivergent people. It rejects the idea of normal, which came from eugenics in the first place. It advocates for supports that focus on adaptive skills and quality of life instead of normalization and challenges the notion that autistic people experience innate social impairments because socialization is bidirectional. So it's really important to keep in mind when you talk about the neurodiversity movement that it includes really diverse people with diverse perspectives. There's no one single leader. There's no manifesto. So people will disagree about some of these core principles or have other principles. And so one key thing you need to do when trying to develop neurodiversity inclusive spaces is to figure out what you mean by neurodiversity and neurodiversity inclusive together. And so the neurodiversity movement has sparked this really exciting and incredible change in autism research and advocacy and in supports that I've been so excited to see over the course of my career. But this change has also not helped everyone to the same degree as we've talked about. And in, even though it hasn't helped everyone to the same degree, it has started to spread to other communities. So there's a neurodiversity movement in the stuttering community, in the dyslexia community, in mental health condition communities. There's even a neurodiversity movement in the sociopathy community. So it's spread to a whole range of different communities, which allows people to build power together and build alliances across communities, which helps them promote systems change. But as I just mentioned, even though it has led to these fundamental shifts in autism advocacy and research and care and spread to their communities, it hasn't helped people who are marginalized in other ways to the same degree. So women struggle to be diagnosed, non-binary people struggle to be recognized with their identities, people with intellectual disabilities are really underrepresented in research, and thus we don't know what types of interventions actually help them. Non-speaking people often struggle to access alternative and augmentative communication, and when they do access it, they're often not trusted to be communicating as they actually are. And autistic people who are minorities, ethnic and racial minorities, struggle to be identified and to receive care. So there's huge disparities in autism care, as we know about. And so now that we've set up what the neurodiversity movement is, I want to give you a few little tips about how to communicate across neurotypes. So the first is that we're all neurodiversity. So when you talk about a neurodiverse person, it doesn't really make sense logically with the way that the term was initially defined, because neurodiversity is a, is a quality of systems, not of a specific person. That said, there are a lot of autistic people who identify as neurodiverse, and that's an important part of their identity. So you want to respect that when that's the case. Neuro minority or neurodivergent tend to be more precise, but in every case, you want to ask the people that you're communicating with what they prefer and adapt to it. There's a similar situation with person-first or identity-first language. So a lot of autistic people prefer identity-first language because they want autism to be recognized as a central aspect of who they are. But this, this differs across cultural contexts. There was a study that just came out in the Netherlands that showed that autistic people there, a lot of them tend to prefer person-first language. So you want to adapt to what people prefer, keeping in mind that a majority of autistic people, at least in online studies, prefer identity-first language. And then this is a really, really key one to keep in mind, which is this higher, low-functioning terminology. So some autistic people identify as high functioning. You can have a situation where a person wants to mark themselves as different from a quote unquote low functioning person. But there's also been a broader move towards rejecting these functioning labels because they're very imprecise. And when terms are imprecise, they tend to be the basis for stereotypes. So if you look at papers that talk about high or low functioning, you'll see sometimes they won't even say what they mean. And sometimes they'll say that they mean Intelligence, language skills, behavioral differences, it's really, really imprecise. And if you use these terms, you, you often mark a person who's quote unquote low functioning as not able to understand their situation and express their preferences. 
or a person as, who's high functioning, quote unquote, as not able, not in need of supports that they might need. So just keep in mind that how all people function varies across contexts. There's no high or low functioning. And so now I'm going to talk about universal design, which I know is the basis of what you're doing here. We all know that autistic people have diverse strengths and weaknesses, and it's really common for autistic people to be gifted in one area and struggle in another. So universal design is preparing for and adapting to the needs of your diverse students. Sometimes when people think about universal design, they just focus on the preparing for part. But it's really important to keep in mind that this is a process, and an iterative process, where you prepare for diversity, but then you learn from your students how to adapt. It's not like a, you do it and then it will keep working. And so the next few slides are from a training that TC and I led development of with those eight autistic and seven non-autistic scholars that I talked about before. So you'll have access when we send around the slides after the talk to the full training and can explore it in depth. This training, we evaluated it and found some evidence that it was helpful in terms of improving autism knowledge and stigma and attitudes toward inclusion, but it was a quasi-experimental study, which means that we can't be sure it was our training that led to these benefits or just things that happened in society. So whenever you're looking at supports, it's really important to look at the evidence for the supports and whether you have experimental studies or more quasi-experimental studies and to take things with more of a grain of salt if they haven't been evaluated as rigorously. So universal design was adapted from a range of different fields, as tends to be the case with any type of support for neurodivergent people, interdisciplinary approaches tend to be stronger. And the goal of universal design is to create multiple pathways for learners to engage with, understand, and express their understanding of information. So UD is proactive, as I mentioned. It aims to reduce barriers in curriculum, we say here, but also in the workplace that make it harder for neurodivergent people to succeed, and it's distinct from accommodations. So accommodations, you usually have to supply documentation that you have a disability, and then you get extra time on tests or whatever accommodation that you've advocated for. This is helping all people. So the goal is to help all students by making systemic changes in your approach. It's important to point out that when people talk about universal design, this statement that it helps all students is something that hasn't been really systematically evaluated. So there's not a lot of research that shows that making a change for one type of student helps all students. And that's a really, really key area where people need to focus if they're going to make, make some of the claims that we tend to make about universal design. It's an approach that was adapted by policy before some of the needed research was conducted because it is so intuitive and makes so much sense to us. But it's, it really highlights the need to assess universal design approaches and see if they're actually helping. In this video, which was developed for our training, one of the collaborators in the training, Stephen Shore, shares an example of universal design from his own experiences as a professor. Hi, everyone. Just sharing a few thoughts about how educational planning for individuals with learning differences ends up benefiting all students. For example, I am commonly alerted by the student support office of a pupil needing a copy of my lecture notes from a course I'm teaching or perhaps an advanced organizer, I don't know why they just don't call it an agenda, to help prepare the student for the course material. After informing the office that I always have the periods agenda and slides available online for all students. I then quickly get a return email saying that nothing further needs to be done. Another example of preparing for all learning styles brings to mind when a student disclosed to me that his ADHD resulted in laboriously slow and mostly illegible handwriting, resulting in poor grades for in-class writing assignments, and this would doom him to fail the latest project of describing components of an electronic music lab and how they work together. He thought for a few moments and then requested that he be allowed to draw a map of the electronic music studio instead of writing it out. This alternative approach to demonstrating mastery made perfect sense to me as I then realized my goal was to assess for mastery of content rather than how fast or neatly he could write. This seemed to be a much better strategy than suggesting he dropped the course and returned later after practicing penmanship. In fact, 
The strategy of mapping, rather than writing about the electronic music lab, was so intriguing to me that I included this as a permanent option for this assignment. We have so much to learn from our students. We only need to observe and listen. Especially poignant is that I already knew this student understood the electronic music lab better than his classmates and was even more facile in some aspects of the equipment than I. So it was a matter of forcing a student into a preconceived notion of subject mastery and him failing the assignment, or I could empower him to demonstrate his ability in the best way he knew how. Understanding the universal design and learning concept of providing varied ways for students to acquire material, process it, and demonstrate mastery goes a long way towards empowering them to reach their potential. And we should be doing this for every single student. And so this really speaks to the question about interview skills, because we often get caught up in assessments and, and our assessments because they've always been used the way they have. But there is a large body of research showing that interviews don't project performance on the workplace very well at all. And so we want to think about, do our assessments actually measure what we're trying to measure, or are we creating barriers with the assessments? And then look for assessments that have stronger evidence of predicting performance, like behavioral observations, where people know in advance what to expect. And the next video that I'm going to share was also developed for our training. It's Patrick Dwyer is this incredible autistic researcher who I met when he was a PhD student. He founded INSAR's Autistic Researchers Committee with TC when they were both PhD students. And he's currently a, research, um, a researcher in Australia. So this was made when he was still a graduate student. Hello. I'm an autistic student, a graduate student, and um, teaching assistant. And as a TA, certainly I want to make sure that we have high expectations for students and that we're evaluating them fairly. Uh, I'm sure that as instructors, you share these concerns. And I wonder if some of you might be thinking about whether universal design and disability accommodations might actually lower our expectations or make evaluation unfair. And I don't think that they do. First of all, on the question of universal design, this is something that we're doing that should be benefiting everybody. It is universal, um, so it's not unfair. And then as to the question of expectations, since this is making it easier for everyone to learn, um, it seems kind of like this is actually raising our expectations, it's making it so that people can learn more out of the class. So that's good. Um, Disability accommodations might be a little more complex because here we are uh, explicitly uh, making this available to particular individuals, um, and that might seem to be unfair, it might seem to be something like special treatment, but I really don't think so. Um, this is um, something that is acknowledging the fact that there are some barriers, some specific challenges that some people are facing that is preventing them um, from uh, either learning the class material or demonstrating that learning. But they are still able to learn the class material, still able to demonstrate their learning. They have that ability. Um, and if you um, provide the accommodation, then they're able to do so. So really this is just um, creating a level playing field by eliminating some barriers that were unintentionally put in place by non-disabled people who didn't um, anticipate that disabled people would face these specific barriers. Um, but it is definitely not lowering expectations um, or making things unfair because the disabled student receiving the accommodations still has to learn the same things as everybody else and demonstrate that learning. It's really cool to see Patrick's video on all these different monitors at once, because we worked so hard to develop this training. And it, like we got a lot of people to do it who gave us really positive feedback. But it's just cool to see it in a, in a live moment. That's one of the recommendations from our training study, is that this type of training is just a first step. And then there needs to be dialogues, like you have here, to think about what works and doesn't work and process and, and continually refine. So it's just a starting point that you'll change as you learn what works in your context. 
And Patrick is here really highlighting a really common misconception about universal design, which is like, we need to prepare people for how tough the world's going to be. So if we make things too easy in, in university, they won't be prepared for the difficulties of the real world, when the reality is that institutions outside of academic institutions need to be adapting too, and a lot of them are adapting. So there's emerging work pointing to universal design being effective in the workplace as well. Again, here you need to think about the evidence and what it means to be effective, because this is a very new area. So across all of these domains in university and also in the workplace, we need to think about how to develop stronger evidence that things work, because when we have stronger evidence that things work, we have a stronger tool to try to convince people to build the type of systemic change that you're all seeking. And so these are a few tips that we came up with about how we can better support students who are diverse in multiple ways. One is openly valuing neurodiversity and diversity more generally. And this is a really important one, because there's a lot of interesting work in organizational psychology asking if diversity in teams is helpful. And there are settings when it is, and there are settings when it isn't. And one of the key settings where it is helpful is where you set up that diversity is valued. If you don't set that up to begin with, you can end up with conflict and other things that aren't beneficial at all. So setting up the value of diversity from the beginning is very, very important. Collaboratively developing clear expectations is also super important. Building from students' strengths and interests because a lot of autistic people have very focused interests. Patrick's research focuses on what he calls monotropism 2.0, to examine people's interests in relation to sensory differences. Recognizing that students may be masking, so people might seem like they're doing just fine. They might express to you that they're doing just fine, but they're not really. And finding ways to figure out if people are masking by asking them maybe in advance, so you can adapt. Mm -hmm and helping avoid burnout. So burnout is a major issue for everyone in society nowadays, I think, but particularly for neurodivergent people. So really breaking, building in time to process and relax is really important. In my class this term, my students are developing neurodiversity manifestos where they have to articulate what they think the key principles of neurodiversity affirmative approaches are and then set forth these policies. And one of the students pointed out that he thinks a central principle of neurodiversity affirmative approaches is time to, to relax and take vacations and breaks and that he hopes that the world in general is moving toward having more time to just process and think about things, which I thought was really insightful. Prioritizing well-being and person environment fit Helping students advocate is really important. So advocating for their sensory differences, for the types of supports that they need, and helping them identify allies is super important. Then providing multiple ways to communicate and engage, helping students shape their own learning experiences, and asking what students need before you meet with them, after you meet with them, realizing that this is an iterative process of learning as you go along, but people won't always know what they need up front. They'll realize it in the setting as they go along and fostering community and learning from one another. So now we're going to move into work integrated learning, which in full transparency is an, an, a relatively new topic for TC and I. So we had to look into the research related to this, because Canada seems to be way ahead of the US in this regard. So there's research about work integrated learning, as you all know, which suggests a number of benefits. One of the benefits is in terms of a key universal design principle, which is doing work that actually relates to your interests. A lot of academic work doesn't, and work integrated learning has the potential to really build on people's interests and motivate them. It also has clear benefits in terms of helping people understand their skills, their challenges, their interests, and also helping them understand workplaces, build relationships that they could use to get jobs and understand the career decision-making processes, so the benefits of different positions. However, this research, first of all, has been conducted primarily with people without any known diagnoses. And second of all, there's also a range of challenges that are apparent in the work integrated learning literature. One is difficulties finding placements, which I know is a concern for students here as well. These difficulties can be because it's hard to figure out how to get a placement. Then it can be hard to find a placement that matches your interests. There's also concerns about gatekeeping. So there's at least some work showing that GPA requirements reduce diversity in work integrated learning and also don't predict performance, just like interviews don't. So GPAs can really be compounding marginalized access issues instead of really helping you. Insufficient supports. So insufficient supports both in terms of training for the 
the, the sites, the people that will be supervising them, and also insufficient supports for the students in terms of training to help them on the job, and also insufficient supports in terms of mental health concerns, because it's really common for students to report imposter syndrome or all kinds of mental health issues. And we know that mental health issues in students and everyone have been compounded by all of the ongoing societal crises that we've been experiencing. And also, just like we see in the universal design literature, there's a lot of difficulties seeing if work integrated learning really helps people. And this is because it's so contextual, so individualized for a lot of people. So similar challenges as we see with universal design are also apparent in this literature. It's a literature where we really need stronger assessment. And one of the key challenges that kind of underlies a lot of these challenges is just that you're communicating with many different types of people. And that's hard. It's hard to get everyone on the same page and develop ways of communicating that work for getting everyone on the same page. And also, you're communicating across a range of contexts. So that's some of the things in the work integrated learning literature focused on students without disabilities. Again, I'm new to it, so there's a lot of research that I'm not discussing here. And then there's a small amount of research that's emerging that's focusing on autistic students and work integrated learning. And this research suggests that it can be really beneficial for some autistic students. They can find a really valuable source of community in it and a way to build on their interests. So one student said any time they give me feedback, they would run it by the college tutor to make sure it wouldn't damage my confidence. So getting a lot of support from their work integrated learning supervisors. But others describe being turned down from placements, often without even meeting people, just because people had heard that they were autistic and experiencing stigma or feeling really pressured to mask because they felt like they wouldn't be able to get a site if they didn't, not disclosing because they're concerned about the stigma they might face. So a lot of issues with gatekeeping that are compounded for autistic students. So one student reported that they didn't get the position they applied for because the potential supervisor thought that because they were autistic, they'd have to like monitor them constantly and wouldn't be able to leave them alone at any point in time. And another student felt that they couldn't talk about being autistic because somehow being autistic was unprofessional. So the key issue here that's emerging from this very small literature is a lack of clear policies to guide partners and ensure that neurodivergent students are valued and supported. We need really clear policies so the students can advocate. When there aren't policies to reach back to, it's hard for students to advocate and it's hard for other people to advocate for them. And then we were, we were lucky enough when planning this talk to talk with a few students from U Calgary. And similar themes emerged when talking to those students. One student had a really interesting insight that some neurodivergent students might not be drawn to work integrated learning because they want to focus. So it's distracting to try to do two things at once. They want to do their degree and then do work. And this is something I've seen in the mentorship program that I run at CUNY. Some students, when we talk to them about developing work skills, they're like, I'm busy right now. I'm focusing on my college, this, this is enough, and then I'll do work later. And so this is a valid concern for some students. Students also reported not enough available information, and particularly about which, students are, which sites are neurodiversity inclusive. So how do students figure out where they're going to be pressured to mask, or where they're going to be supported? That's really hard to know if there's no clear guidelines about that. And also this concern that bridges both the emerging research about autistic students and work integrated learning and the broader literature about having a hard time finding places that match your interests. And this can be particularly difficult for autistic students because interests are such a fundamental part of learning for all students, but particularly autistic students. And then another student made a really, really important point is that the process of finding a work integrated learning site in some situations where you have to find it yourself recapitulates the barriers that we see in all of the literature around the world showing that autistic people have a hard time getting jobs. So it's like, get yourself a work integrated learning site and people are like, I'm facing systemic oppression. I can't get a work integrated learning site myself. So this is a really, really key issue. And one student said, that's precisely what I need help with, is finding a match to my interests and skills. So developing mechanisms to help people find sites that are neurodiversity inclusive and that match their interests and skills is really important. And so now I'm going to move into systems change because we can see that there's huge issues in higher education with access, in the workplace with access, and also even in work integrated learning. So we need to change these systems that are oppressing people. And whenever you want to develop systems change, you need to think about what your underlying values are. Because the underlying values 
need to be shared with the people that are working together and articulated to be able to drive that systems change. Otherwise, there's often hidden differences that make it so people have a harder time working together. So our work is rooted in the neurodiversity model, as it seems like the work here is as well. We talked about the medical model and issues with the medical model earlier, and it's focused on making people normal and, and situating difficulties within people instead of recognizing that they're about the fit between the person and the environment. Also in the medical model approach, historically supports for autistic people have been developed without input from autistic people and leadership from autistic people, which is probably part of why they focus so much on normalization. Then I'm sure people are familiar with the social model, where all of the difficulties associated with a disability are attributed to society. And the goal is to change society, because that is where the difficulties that a disability comes with come from. And the neurodiversity movement is situated in between these two models. Sometimes when people think about the neurodiversity movement, they think it's exactly the same as the social model. Some theorists think this too, so this is something that people don't agree on. But a lot of neurodiversity theorists think it's in between the two because it recognizes that most of the challenges associated with neurodivergence come from society, but some of them are internal. And so supports need to address those issues in society and also help people address challenges that they're experiencing, like in terms of sensory processing. And in both the social model and the neurodiversity movement model, supports are developed by and with autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people. So this model comes from the broader disability rights movement. You'll notice that in the broader disability rights movement, people tend to use person-first language. And the reason for that is because they fought for a long time to be recognized as people separate from their disability. And the reason that a lot of autistic people take on identity first language is because they view autism as something to be proud of, something that's central to their identity that should be respected. And so the neurodiversity movement is building on a long history of advocacy across disabilities. And it started with autistic people, but again is branching out to other conditions. So it's like a new form of the disability rights movement. And this is a quote that TC um, said when, in the meeting with the students that we both found really, really powerful, everyone present did, is that accommodations are innovations of the future. So what we learn together when accommodating specific students then become the principles of universal design to accommodate all students, to offer as a choice as you go forward. So we're transforming society step by step as we figure out creatively ways to accommodate people in school and the workplace. And the example she has here is the curb cut example which is commonly used to illustrate universal design, but started as a specific accommodation. TC also thought it was really, really important to emphasize belongingness, because belongingness is a protector against mental health issues, and it's also a key factor that supports success in college and the workplace. So it helps people be engaged in their roles, be productive, be resilient, be committed to their company and satisfied with their job. And a key thing that we learned from the belongingness literature is that diverse leadership, so seeing people like you in leadership roles, is central to belonging. If you only see people who aren't like you in leadership roles, it's really hard to feel that you belong. You feel kind of like an add-on. So diverse leadership is a really important part of systems change. And belongingness can mitigate systemic barriers by creating social connections, like you're building here, and through a lot of the work here, a caring culture and a responsive environment. And so participatory approaches are key to belonging because you have diverse people throughout leadership roles developing the initiatives and building community together and also key to systems change, as Milton pointed out. So they position community members as experts about their own experience. They use democratic decision-making processes to maximize the participation of those affected by projects in developing and assessing them. And this issue of democratic decision-making processes is central to having a truly participatory approach. Because although there's been a move in autism research toward participatory approaches, which is really, really exciting, there's also some examples of inauthentic participatory approaches, where a person might say they did a participatory study and then they publish it and it's just them as the author or something like that. That's fairly common. So inauthenticity, similar to the issue we raised about neurodiversity light, is a concern in participatory approaches as well. We have to find clear ways to make decisions that work in our situation and document those decisions to be able to ensure that we're being authentically participatory. 
And it's also important to point out that participatory processes are iterative. So when we first developed the mentorship program that I lead at CUNY, we called it participatory right away, which we shouldn't have, because we're like, we want students to lead it. <laughs> but it took a while for students to, to want to lead it and to see leaders that would allow them to step into leadership roles and imagine themselves in those roles. So we called ourselves participatory before we became participatory, although over time we did. We wouldn't make that mistake now because of the concerns about inauthentic participatory Approaches, but the processes are iterative. We learn as we go along. And so one of the things that we've learned through doing participatory work is that it's really hard. It's really, really challenging because there's such a diversity of opinions and perspectives. And it, it can be easy to fall into approaches that aren't truly authentic or to promise that you'll make changes and to not make changes. And so we're developing a paper right now describing challenges that we experienced in our game design and employment workshop study and that a, a large network of um, autistic researchers who've been helping guide the AARP network have been documenting. And so what, these are key recommendations we've made from challenges that we're noticing in both of these participatory approaches. They're ongoing, like it's a manuscript in preparation, but these are what we're currently recommending. One is to clearly define and establish consensus on shared values, roles, and decision-making processes with all stakeholders. Another is to develop multimodal communication protocols that balance accessible summaries and detailed accounts. I tend to err on the side of really long emails, which are really inaccessible. And so finding ways to communicate that give people the precision if they want it without overwhelming them is really important. Creating training resources to help team members commit to shared values and clear roles, like you're documenting here with the student contracts. <laughs> that, what you're doing with that is super cool. Building accountability processes, including transparently documenting decisions, is really important, and ensuring there are enough resources available to support goals. So this paper is one that TC is one of the authors on. It's led by Emily Hotez, who's um, one of the leaders in the AARP network. And it's one that we think will be really important for thinking about ways that participatory approaches can fall short and strategies to address those. And so I'm going to show you a few examples of those types of processes. One is defining what you mean by neurodiversity affirmative. So in our game design and employment workshop, we would keep telling our partners and the educators last summer about our desire to have neurodiversity affirmative approaches, but we realized we hadn't defined what we meant. And that led to a lot of tension. So it's really, really important when you use terms like neurodiversity affirmative or neurodiversity inclusive to figure out what you mean. And it can differ across contexts. In, in this context, when we ran into issues with some people being normalizing and things like that and had to develop these principles, we pulled from the literature, like Sue Fletcher Watson's really exciting work in this area. This is a really amazing talk she gave about neurodiversity affirmative principles. And neurodivergent students in our, in our leadership develop the principles based on what they'd observe. So you can see there Elizabeth Kilgallen, right next to the arrow, who's currently a clinical PhD student at the University of Boston, Massachusetts Amherst, who's autistic. And Ellie Grossman, who works with me at CUNY, developed these principles and then Sinead, the postdoc on the study, and I helped revise them and we voted on them as a group to ensure that we all agreed on what we were talking about when we talked about neurodiversity affirmative going forward. So what these would look like in your setting might be different, and that's totally fine. You just want to figure out what neurodiversity affirmative means for everyone involved in your setting. And a key one for us is nothing about us without us. And this is the communications guide that TC developed with Patrick Dwyer, who you saw before, and Brett Knappman, who's an autistic professor at the University of Arkansas, who does a lot of really amazing work leading the College Autism Network. Have people heard of the College Autism Network? So when we send around the slides, we should send you uh, the link to the College Autism Network because they have a lot of amazing resources focused on employment as well and, and more structure-based changes to employment initiatives, as well as a lot of research focused on autistic college students. They're centered in the US, but it's an international network. And so this, this document helped people write non-bewildering emails, help people present in accessible ways. So it's a really useful resource. And these resources, there's links to them in the resources for these slides. This is the accessibility guidelines that TC found developed by the Manitoba Accessibility Office, where they focused, they focused on three types of barriers. One was attitudes, one was physical environments, so like 
sensory environments that are uncomfortable, and one was communication barriers. And you can see here attitudinal barriers that people might encounter, as well as solutions to those attitudinal barriers. And, and this is a longer resource that has a whole range of barriers and a whole range of solutions. And like one of the key barriers in terms of attitudes is assuming that there's only one way to do a job and working with people who are neurodivergent to develop other ways of doing a job. Another thing is thinking that accommodations are expensive when a lot of times they aren't expensive. They, they're pretty simple if you just work together to develop exactly what's needed. This is another training resource that TC found, which is a really cool one for educating employers. There's a lot of work in Australia drawn from the neurodiversity movement paradigm, and this one is out of La Trobe University. So this is the first page of a longer resource. And you'll notice here that they talk about both strengths associated with autism and also challenges to not feed into that neurodiversity light commodification of autism concern. Anytime you use a resource, you'll want to think about how to adapt it to your context if there's certain things you want to problematize because all of the resources are things in progress. This is something that I learned about through the College Autism Network actually just a few days ago. People were emailing about this. This is the image network out of the, um, Europe that was developed in collaboration with neurodivergent people to develop a lot of training resources. So focused on helping autistic people, but also on educating employers. So this is a really, really valuable resource. You just see a few of the resources that are available here, but the link to this is also in the resources. This one is a particularly cool one that I wasn't aware of until the College Autism Network emailed about it. So it's really good to get on our listserv. There's a lot of vibrant discussion and a lot of really useful resource sharing. And also, if you just like have a question about your program or your study or whatever, people will respond and give you feedback. It's a very, very supportive network. It's really transformed work in higher ed, focused on autism. It used to be very siloed, and now there's a community of people working together. This is an example of an, a transparent accountability process adapted from Aspire, which was the first participatory autism research group developed initially and still led by Christina Nicolaitis and Dora Raymaker. And this is the process for figuring out when you have consensus and when you need to have more discussion. So an iterative process of documenting what people think and then seeing where you need to improve and change what you're discussing and then transparently documenting these decisions. And having points where everyone can weigh in is super important for making sure that everyone's heard and that you have really clear and transparent decision-making processes. And then this is examples of potential policy changes, like the students as partners contracts that you're developing and using here. Also, like the education about neurodiversity you're doing here and the NICE initiative, which looked super exciting. The need for student supports and having that be a policy initiative and advocacy guides for students. Check-ins during programs. And also a database of neurodiversity inclusive sites came up when we were talking with students as something that was needed. And when you think of a database of neurodiversity inclusive sites, you, you then need to think, what do I mean by neurodiversity inclusive? My, my hope about education and work integrated learning and employment is that people move in an increasingly hybrid direction, because I think that balances the accessibility and community making, but I'm, I'm not sure if things are moving in that direction. Well, thank you all. <laughs>